It's 4.30 a.m. on the south side of Chicago. A man pulls up to his place of business. His doors won't open till 5. It's the depression and folks don't have a lot of money, but there's already a long line of people in front of his place. While other businesses are struggling, his business is booming. And he will have a steady stream of customers until his doors close at 1 a.m. When he leaves, he will have earned up to $10,000. He was a hero in his community, and he employed thousands of black folks, helping them put food on the table. He sold a product that for the last 40 years or so had made many men rich on the South Side. Men like Daniel McKee Jackson, Walter Kelly, Mushmouth Johnson, Jesse Binger, Robert Motts, Henry Tina Jones and his brother Charlie Giverdam Jones. Who is he? His name is Teddy Rowe, and he sells dreams one penny at a time. Hey, you guys, guys and bums. Welcome back to A Few Bad Men. I hope everybody enjoyed their turkey day. I hope you got to spend it with all your family and your loved ones and all that good stuff. And if not, you always got your family here at A Few Bad Men. We always got your back. Now, before I get into this, I have to tell you that Teddy has to be the most requested gangster on the channel. I can't tell you how many requests I've gotten for him, but I had to do this one for you guys. So I finally got enough to give you the skinny on Ted. All right. So, you know, we got a little business to handle. So if you're new here and you like what we do over here, a few bad men, you want to join the gang. First thing you got to do is you got to bump off that subscribe button. Second thing you got to do is you got to break that thumb and you got to ring that bell and sell it for all notifications. OK, if you want the uncut versions and you want the videos a little early, you got to subscribe to the few bad men Patreon channel. There you can get all the videos early and the uncut videos that I can't show you on YouTube. All right. So without further ado, let's get into this. Theodore Rowe was born August 26, 1898 in Galliano, Louisiana. His parents were sharecroppers. And while he was still a kid, the family relocated to Little Rock, Arkansas. And that's where Teddy grew up. He was a mulatto black man. He was what they called passing meaning that he was so light that he could pass for a white man. As a kid, he was harassed by the other kids for this. But Teddy didn't endure teasing for long. He would soon become one of the city's toughest guys. He had a short fuse, said what he felt, and backed his words with his fists. Sometime in his youth, Teddy got a job at a tailor shop, and he would learn the tailor's trade. At the start of World War I, Teddy was given a uniform and a gun and sent to fight for his country. There's no record of his service, but his death certificate said that he served. By the time Prohibition hit, Teddy was back in Little Rock. He built a still and became a small-time bootlegger. After several run-ins with the local sheriff, Teddy came to the conclusion that Little Rock was too small to hold him and his ambitions. So after marrying Carrie Givens in 1923, he moved to Detroit. Teddy, like a lot of blacks who moved from the South in the 20s, worked in the newly formed auto industry. Not much is known about Teddy's life in Detroit, but by 1931, he had lost his job at the auto factory and made his way to Chicago's South Side. He got a job in a tailor shop. The tailor shop was at 4312 South Indiana Avenue. It was owned by the Jones brothers, and it was a front for their policy wheel, Chicago's turn for a numbers house. The brothers had the fastest rising wheel on the South Side, and Teddy worked out of the tailor shop as a bookmaker. He also oversaw another wheel five blocks to the South. Now, we can't talk about Teddy Rowe without talking about the Jones brothers, Ed, George, and McKissick, known as Mac. Sons of Harry and Wynn and the Reverend Dr. Edward Perry Jones, a very influential person in the African Methodist Church, were born in Vicksburg, Mississippi. Ed in 1897, George in 1902, and Mac in 1905. In 1918, the Reverend Dr. moved his family to Everston, Illinois a suburb of Chicago, to take the pastorship of the Mount Zion Baptist Church. In 1921, they moved to the south side of Chicago. And in 1924, Reverend Dr. Jones died. The family used the insurance money to get into the policy game. In late 28 or 29, the Jones brothers opened their first policy station at 4312 South Indiana, in the area known as Bronzeville. Within a month, the Jones brothers had the hottest station in the area forcing many smaller stations to cease operation. By the end of the summer of 1929, they were fast becoming the biggest wheel in Bronzeville. They were known for running a fair game. If you hit, you got paid. Ed became a political figure and had friends in high places, including a black cop stationed at the Wabash station named Bill Baxter. Bill Baxter would be the Jones' eyes and ears in the police department. 
he would tip the Joneses off to raids and be a bodyguard to Ed Jones and later to Teddy Rowe. Now back in the 20s, after Al Capone took over in 25, he had his eyes on the policy game in the Black Belt of Chicago. But by the end of the 20s, he had come to an arrangement with the Black Policy Kings. He would stay out of the numbers game if they stayed out of the bootleg beer business. On May 16, 1929, Al was arrested in Philadelphia for the possession of a deadly weapon. While he was on the shelf, other Italian gangsters saw the Policy Kings as easy marks. So on December 12, 1929, Policy King Walter Kelly, who ran the biggest wheel on the South Side, was driving on the South Parkway with his girlfriend, Leotine Costello, on their way home. When all of a sudden, a black sedan pulled along and forced Kelly to the curb. Four armed men got out, and one of them said, Come on, Walter, someone wants to talk to you. The man grabbed Kelly and forced him into the back of the black sedan and peeled off. A few hours later, Leotine received a phone call from a Capone man named William Westside Sharkey. Kelly's family paid $25,000 for his release. After this, Kelly put his organization on hold while they assessed the danger. Meanwhile, the Jones Brothers organization was taking its place as the number one wheel. They brought the building at 4724 South Michigan Avenue. Each of the brothers took an apartment and they furnished it with the finest things money could buy. Each apartment had three bathrooms decorated with gold fixtures, glass showers, and two wash bowls. They employed white servants to keep their things shiny and paid them well. Mother Jones was placed in a building not far from her boys with the same amenities and a handsome chauffeur to keep her company and to guard her body. The Jones family loved to spend money. Furs, jewelry, cars. They bought property in Mexico and also owned a villa in Paris. They helped many a youngster through college and were seen as heroes in the community. Ed Jones was active in the Democratic Party and captain of the Fifth Ward. He wore hand-painted ties and expensive suits, always with fresh white shirts that he never wore twice. While the Jones brothers were living it up, Teddy Rowe ran the day-to-day. -day. Teddy Rowe moved his wife into a flat on Vincennes that used to belong to George Jones, that he decorated extravagantly and had a six-foot television set that sat on a pedestal that could be turned 360 degrees. By the beginning of the 40s, the Joneses were one of the wealthiest black families in America, pulling in an estimated $2 million a year. Living lavishly in the face of authorities has been the downfall of many a gangster, and the Joneses were no exception. When the IRS looked into the Joneses, they found that between 1933 and 1938, the Joneses spent $2,721,911 while only paying taxes on $1,338,274. The Joneses argued that they had paid their taxes. The government agreed, but said it wasn't enough. The case was weak until a former employee of Ed Jones, Ezra Leak, testified that the Joneses intentionally paid less than they were supposed to. Leak and Ed Jones had a falling out a few years prior, and Jones fired him. The beef got so bad that Leak was arrested outside of Jones' apartment with a pistol. Jones changed his plea to not guilty and asked that all charges against his brothers be dropped. He would take all the responsibility. The court complied, and Ed Jones was sentenced to 28 months in Terre Haute, Indiana. While in prison, Ed was reunited with an old acquaintance named Billy Skidmore. Skidmore was a bagman between the outfit and the political establishment. Skidmore introduced Ed to the man who would be the downfall of the black policy racket, Sam Mooney Giancana. Sam Giancana was a small-time member of the outfit at that time. The three became friends, and Ed would brag about all the money he made in the policy game. And eventually, he would start to tell everything, all the ins and outs of the game and how to make money. Ed had broken the cardinal rule, never teach the game to outsiders, especially white outsiders. Ed even promised Mooney and Skidmore that he would set them up with a policy station of their own when he got out. But Skidmore never got out. He died of a heart attack in his cell on February 18, 1944. But Mooney got an early release in 1942. Back on the streets, he wasted no time getting the ball rolling. Ed sent Mooney to meet with George to get things started. The next day, Mooney went to see Paul Rica, who at that time was one of the leaders of the outfit, along with Tony Accardo and Jake Guzik. Mooney came to Rika with his plan to take over the policy game from the blacks, and Rika gave him the go-ahead. The time was right. The government had cracked down on the policy kings. On February 2nd, 1942, 26 of the city's biggest policy men turned themselves into the authorities, including Mac and George Jones. Later in 1942, Mac Jones was tragically killed when his car was struck by a drunk driver going the wrong way. When Ed Jones got out in 1944, he kept his word and became partners with Mooney by investing $100,000 into a vending machine and jukebox venture. Mooney made a guy named Fat Leonard Caifano his lieutenant. 
Caifano was a 400 pound tough guy and he was already making moves in the policy takeover. Mooney and Fat Leonard bought about 12,000 machines and placed them in the bars around the city. Ed Jones and Mooney Giancana had a good business relationship, but many in the Jones organization didn't like it. One of them was Teddy Rowe. While Ed was away, Teddy was in charge and he would often warn Ed Jones about the Italians. He said they were snakes and not to be trusted. As soon as they got the chance, they stabbed you in the back. Sam Giancana soon realized that he would not be able to smooth talk Teddy the way he did Ed Jones. Teddy and Mooney began bumping heads. One night, Mooney was leaving a bar that he owned called the Boogie Woogie. The bar catered to a mostly black clientele, and when he bumped into Teddy Rowe who was coming in, Teddy said, what are you doing here in the black bar? Mooney said, I own it, and soon I'll own you. Teddy lunged at Mooney, mother f I'll kill you. The two were separated by Mooney's brother Chuck and the bar manager who stuck a revolver into Teddy's ribs. Mooney laughed and said, you're out of your league, Teddy. Mooney had the full back end of the outfit, and he was ready to make his move. On December 29th, 1943, George Jones and his lady friend were forced to the curb while driving. Four men got out and robbed a couple of jewelry and cash. Two weeks later, the Ben Franklin, one of the Jones' major stations, was broken into and robbed for $6,000. Then Teddy Rowe made a mistake of letting two men into his place who he thought were state attorney police. Teddy and his wife were tied up and robbed at gunpoint. In 1945, Mooney called Teddy in for a meeting. He wanted Teddy to pay him $1,000 a week or he would expose him to the press. Teddy laughed, got up and left, and said he would never give in. On another occasion, Mooney met with Teddy in the back seat of an associate's car. Again, Mooney pressed Teddy, and again Teddy laughed. This time, Mooney made a move. Teddy thought he was reaching for his gun, and he grabbed Mooney by the arm and twisted behind his back. The associate tried to get him to stop. Teddy said, I'll stop when he gets his hand off his gun. Turns out, Mooney didn't have a gun, and Teddy told him, if you try something like that again, I'll kill you. The next day, Teddy found out Mooney was in the Boston Club, Teddy's hangout. He called and asked for Mooney. Mooney came to the phone, and Teddy told him, I know where you are. And if you're not going in 15 minutes, I'll find out how tough you are. Tensions between Mooney and Teddy were getting very heated. Later that year, Mooney and a guy named Gus Alex approached Teddy for a talk. Teddy knocked Mooney on his ass and Mooney and Gus went for the guns and shots rang out. Teddy's men opened up on the two gangsters, not hitting anything, but sending the pair running. Mooney had had enough. It was time for Ed Jones and Teddy Rowe to move over or die. He considered Ed to be his friend, but he had seen his day. On the evening of May 11, 1946, Ed Jones was in his family limousine being driven by Joe Brock. They pulled up in front of the Ben Franklin to pick up Ed's wife, Lydia, and the head cashier, Miss Frances Miles. The two ladies got into the car. They made a U-turn and headed westbound on 47th Street. They turned right at South Parkway and headed north to 43rd Street to drop Frances off at her apartment. After Frances got out of the car and made it safely inside, Brock was ready to pull off. When a sedan pulled alongside, four men in overcoats, hats, and scarves covering their faces hopped out, each holding a shotgun. The first gunman went to the driver's side window, shoved the shotgun into Brock's face, snatched the keys out of the ignition, and threw them on the floor of the car. The other two shoved guns into Lydia and Ed's faces and said, Are you Ed Jones? Ed replies, Yes. What is this about? The gunman replied, Come on, we want you. Lydia, who was seated behind Ed, grabbed him around the neck and said, You're not taking my husband. She was shoved away, and Ed was pulled from the car and hit in the back of the neck and thrown onto the floor of the sedan. The gunman piled in and took off, followed by another car. Lydia was left screaming in the middle of the street, and this got the attention of a passing police car. After hearing what Lydia had to say, the cop gave chase, followed by Brock and Lydia in the limo. The cop chased what he thought was the getaway car until the car he was chasing fired several shots from the rear window, one of them putting a hole in his windshield. Later that night, Teddy Rowe received a phone call from Lydia. She told him that Ed had been kidnapped, and the kidnappers only wanted to talk to him. After reassuring Lydia that everything would be okay, Teddy went back home and waited for the call. It came the next day. The kidnappers wanted $250,000. Ted said, there ain't that much money on the South Side. And after a few negotiations, they agreed to release Ed for $100,000. George Jones, who had flown back from Mexico with his mother, made the payoff, and Ed Jones was released on the Inglewood Street, blindfolded in his ear stuffed with cotton. This proved to be the downfall of the Jones family. The one-time policy kings were now seen as being too hot, and they posed a threat to the entire black belt. They had made an alliance with outsiders and it came back to bite them in the ass. Even the streets turned against them. They were called miserly. They hadn't given back to the people or the community that made them rich. Ed Jones cut a deal with the outfit. 
he would turn his wheel over to them and stay out of the game for a percentage of the profits. The Joneses moved their family to a villa in Mexico and retired. Even though Sam had removed Ed, the problem was Teddy Rowe. You see, while the Joneses were traveling the world, Teddy was in the trenches, making sure everything ran smooth. He controlled the runners, the routes, the payoffs, and the payouts to the police. Sam reached out to Ed in Mexico, urging him to get Ted in line or someone was going to die. Ed Jones made a call to another high-ranking member in his organization named Robert Wilcox and instructed him to turn over all the ledgers and machines to the outfits and to tell Ted to do the same. Wilcox called Ted at the Boston Club. Ted was racing over to Wilcox's department when he noticed he was being followed. He hit the gas and took off. He screeched to a halt at 47th and Vincennes, hopped out the car and ran. A black sedan pulled up and three men got out and shots rang out. The three men opened up on Teddy. He returned fire and was able to escape through an alley untouched. By 1950, the outfit had removed all the black policy men except one, Teddy Rowe. He was one man against the mob. While he and the outfit were taking shots at each other, they both had a bigger gang looking to take them both out. This gang was led by Tennessee Senator Estev Kivoffer. Kivoffer was on a mission to make a name for himself by exposing and destroying organized crime. From 1950 to 51, Kivoffer went around the country holding televised hearings on organized crime. When Kivoffer brought his tour to Chicago, Teddy Roar was one of the men subpoenaed to talk about the policy game. Ed was also brought back from Mexico, and he was told by the outfit to incriminate Teddy Rowe, but Ed stood silent when he took the stand. After the testimony, Ed Jones and Teddy Rowe were arrested as they left the courthouse and held on a policy racketeering conspiracy. They were eventually freed on bail. Throughout the Kivoffer investigations, they were the only gangsters to ever be arrested after testifying. After Kivoffer left town, the war resumed. Sam Giancana personally met with Teddy and offered him $250,000 to retire from the rackets. Teddy said, I would rather die first. Mooney said, well, my friend, you just might. Sam Giancana had enough with Teddy. Mooney was a stone killer, but he had resisted using deadly force until now. Teddy was making him look bad to the outfit and it would only get worse. On June 17, 1951, Teddy Rowe received a call from Ed Jones. Ed wanted to meet with Teddy and he asked him what was he doing the next day, which was a Monday. Teddy told him that he was going to the racetrack. And in the wee hours of Tuesday, June 19th, 1951, Teddy Rowe had returned from the tracks and he was driving his Lincoln when a car cut him off and flashed a police searchlight into his face. He pulled over, believing it could be police. Three men got out of the car and said they were from the state's attorney. Ted said, how do I know? Show me, show me. One of the men yanked Teddy's door and pulled him from the car. They tried to shove him to the back seat of their car, but Teddy fell to the ground, and while still on the ground, he pulled his gun, and shots rang out. Teddy struck one of the men in the forehead, dropping him instantly. He turned his gun on the other two, wounding one of them. The other one helped his friend into the car while returning fire at Teddy. With his gun empty, Teddy ran and hid in the bushes until he thought it was safe. Then he ran through the park, stashed his gun, and called the police before calling his wife. He told her, I think I just killed two white men. I'm certain I killed one. He said, I didn't know who they were, and I didn't care. I don't scare easy. When they come for me, I'm going to protect myself. I'll fight. They're never going to take me. I'll fight as long as I have breath. Teddy felt that Ed Jones had set him up. He hadn't told anyone but Ed that he was going to the track. Teddy was arrested and held mostly for his protection. Mooney and Tony Accardo, who is now the head of the outfit, were brought in to try to prevent a war because the man Teddy killed was Fat Lenny Caifano, Mooney's partner and godfather to his daughter. Fat Lenny was a made guy, and this would not, could not be tolerated by the outfit. Teddy Rowe was finally released after his charges were dropped to a hero's welcome in the black belt. He let it be known that they would have to kill me. On August 4th, 1952, Teddy was in his house at 5239 Michigan Avenue. Across the street, two men sat in a car behind a billboard. Another car containing two more men sat on the corner. At 1055, Teddy kissed his wife and told her he was leaving. He didn't tell her where he was going, he just walked out. As he walked outside towards his car, two men approached, one from the left and one from the right. As Teddy put his key in the car, the two men leveled shotguns and shots rang out. Both men opened up on Teddy. Five shotgun blasts tore him apart. His wife screamed, Teddy, no, and ran outside to find Teddy lifeless in the gutter. He had a pistol on him, but he never got to it. The papers the next day read, the king is dead. 50,000 people lined the streets to see the hearse carrying the $5,000 coffin that contained the last king of policy. 176 people were brought in and questioned about the hit on Teddy Rowe, but no one was ever charged. And that, my friends, 
is the skinny on Theodore Teddy Rowe. I hope you enjoyed the story as much as I enjoyed telling it. This has been a few bad men. Keep your nose clean and don't take any wooden nickels. I see you in the funnies. <laughs>